I can say what I think is, is difficult about trying to read the Christian tradition in terms of the Greek categories. I think, I think a lot of the time, the, the, I think the Greek culture is very, very different from the Hebraic and the, and the Christian cultures. It seems to me they do have in, say, in the, in the stories of Homer, there's a, an important sense in which gods play a role in the human understanding of the self. But it seems to me that the way the gods play a role in the human understanding of the self in Homer is radically different from the way that Jesus plays a role in the understanding of the self in the, in the, early, in the New Testament text. I'll just give you one example. It's not as though um, it's not as though the Greek gods never come down to earth. They do come down to earth. They come down to earth and they make it possible for Telemachus to stand up and give a, you know, give a speech in front of a crowd. They fill him with courage. They uh, come down and they, and they, you know, sort of, they inhabit Achilles so that Achilles, Ares inhabits Achilles so that Achilles is a great warrior. But when the gods do this, um, Athena comes down and fills up uh, Odysseus. When they do this, though, something interesting happens. The heroes, they become sort of more than human. They are taller and handsomer, and they smell better, and their locks are more curly, and, and they're just, it's as, if, some of this. <laughs> it's, it's as if in order for the gods to come down and sit inside a human being, they, they, they have to puff the human being out. And Jesus is the opposite. Jesus comes down in the most humble form. He's the lowliest. He's the one who has to suffer. It's exactly the opposite. And it seems to me that there are lots of other ways in which the Greek categories and the Greek conceptions, which I think ultimately do give rise to philosophy. I'm a philosopher, but I think there are ways in which philosophy goes wrong and isn't able to account for the complexities of human existence. So there, there are ways in which I think the Greek categories really don't fit the, um, the early, the, the New Testament. That's, that's really interesting, and, and we didn't rehearse this before. I had no idea what Professor Kelly was going to say there, and I'm just fascinated by it because uh, our modern Western culture is all too often a culture of superheroes a culture of larger-than-life people and the whole business of... Um, Bob Jewett wrote a book a few years ago, The Myth of the American Superhero, going back through the comics and movies and so on, where it's always the same story, the guy who's the quiet one who then sees something's wrong, so he puts on a mask or a suit and becomes, you know, does the, does the redemptive violence and then goes back to being an ordinary guy again. And uh, that can be strongly critiqued precisely on the grounds that you say. And I'd like to inject into there one of the foundational biblical um, pictures, which is the idea that God made humans in his own image. Um, and people have speculated, what does that mean? Is it memory? Is it imagination? What is it? I, I go with people who have argued that it's the idea of a sort of angled mirror, that God wants to be known in the world, God wants his stewardship, his care of the world to be flowing out into the world, and humans are the people who, as you said at the beginning, are the ones entrusted with this stewardship. Then when humans mess it up, Abraham and his family are the ones entrusted with putting it right. When they mess it up, Jesus is the one. And the New Testament refers to Jesus as the image of God. And people often read that, people in my tradition read that, and they think, oh wow, that's because he's divine. But actually what it's saying is, he's the genuine human being. And as you say, he's not puffed up. And one of the most crucial things, and before we even talk about the resurrection, I think this is really, really important. People often in my world and my culture say, well, the main thing is we have this God who does miracles. Well, I do believe that God can and does do extraordinary things which you don't expect. But that goes with a philosophical idea of a God who is normally outside the process, as in either Epicureanism or Deism, and who occasionally reaches in and stirs the pot, does something wacky, and then goes away again. And that's not what we find in the Bible. What we find in the Bible is a God who is actually strangely present, often grieving and groaning because of the mess, but then also making something out of that mess. And if I say which of those pictures is more like what I find in the Gospels, it's definitely the second one, which is why Jesus, faced with the question of power, when James and John say, please can we sit at your right and your left, like you and I are sitting at your right and your left right now, um, <laughs> uh, 
I rolled these rolls tonight. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy, enjoy. The, the chance men are coming in. Um, the, the, um, you know, they, they want to be his kind of foreign secretary or chief of staff or whatever. And Jesus says, you have no idea. The pagan nations, Homer's heroes and so on, they do power one way by bullying and, and manipulating and so on. We're going to do it the other way which is the way of service, the way of suffering, and Jesus says, and I'm leading the way. The Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. And so the message of the cross, which Christians have rightly seen in terms of atonement with all that that means, actually nests within the redefinition of power. And I think it's exactly the point you're making. This is an essentially Hebraic reaction against the culture of the rest of the world. It's a deeply countercultural idea, but at the heart of it is this notion of image and this notion then of this is what the kingdom of God looks like. You know, when God wants to sort the world out, he doesn't send in the tanks. That's how we do it. When God wants to sort the world out, he comes into our midst and takes the shock and the shame and the horror upon himself and dies under its weight. That is still the most extraordinary message. The early Christians believed that that was where the whole biblical story was going, and the rest of the world says, what, you must be kidding? They said it then and they say it now, but a lot of people actually think, nope, this makes sense. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.